Today, we're joined by two um, other really dynamic people. One of those is Michelle Coles, who is the author of Black Was the Ink. She'll be in conversation with Mimi Eisen, who is a co-author of Erasing the Black Freedom Struggle as a as a report on reconstruction um, from the Zen Education Project. And I'll pass it off to them. Thanks, Vanessa and Kim and uh, the whole DC Area Educators for Social Justice team. I'm very glad to be here with you all for this session, especially in light of the most recent attacks on, on education, on Black history, Black studies, and all of really the connective movements that help us and our students understand how we got here and how to build a better world. If anything, these attacks reaffirm how important all of our work is. And so speaking of a bit of, of building a better world, let's start talking about reconstruction, the era of emancipation during and after the Civil War. And I want to start with a very short activity in the form of a word cloud. And so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and so if you wouldn't mind, I wanna invite you to reflect on your own experiences learning about reconstruction in K through 12 education with some key terms and take a minute to create a word cloud together. So you can see the instructions are at the top. You can either go to that site, poleev.com, or you can text in um, and share some keywords. Non-existent, always, always shows up past, yeah. Um, what else? And feel free to enter more than more than once. Failed. Um, I don't know if we want to get some some carpetbaggers and scalawags on the board. If that's familiar to anybody, it was certainly part of my miseducation. Um, but let's just take a a couple minutes. And then we'll talk a little more and, and get into our interview with Michelle. Non-existent, missing. Right, so, you know, we learn often, if anything, if we learn anything, officials that, that you know, reconstructions about the status of the rebel states the formation of the KKK, President Andrew Johnson versus Congress versus ex-Confederates, and how will these groups reunify the country, especially with these carpetbaggers and, and scalawags in the mix, these derogatory terms for white Northerners who moved South and white Southerners who supported Reconstruction. So there's this narrative, as, as we see here, and, and every time I put up this word cloud in a workshop, um, that Reconstruction is you know, if we learn about it at all, that it is a short, relatively insignificant, not so great moment between the Civil War and Jim Crow that involved a lot of arguments and debates between white elites figuring out how to rebuild the country, especially. Um, okay, so thanks for that. I'll take this down for now. But, um, so this is sort of the, the story that we learn, if we learn a story at all. And, and then what's left out or minimized in this reconstruction narrative is the central part of the story that meanwhile, and actually you know, fundamental to these struggles over the country's future, millions of formerly enslaved people were actually building something new. They were making the most of freedom, expanding the meaning of freedom in this country in all sorts of ways that we're still working towards, ways that prioritize um, equity and justice, claiming political power, protesting for better labor conditions, drafting laws to redistribute wealth and extend civil rights, 
establishing schools, winning battles against segregation, building churches and mutual aid organizations, and essentially reconstituting their communities around safety and joy, all of which meant challenging the status quo, trying to take down white supremacist systems and ideas baked into the founding and the laws and the economy of this country and everyday life. And Black people and their allies challenged the status quo in the 1860s and 70s on an unprecedented scale. Reconstruction was really a revolution and one cut short by a counter-revolution of white supremacists across regions who united against Black power and multiracial democracy, who united to instead establish and enforce Jim Crow for many decades to come until the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, which in many ways stems from Reconstruction and continues today. And so Reconstruction is such an important and illuminating time in US history and within a longer Black freedom struggle. It shows us that progress is not a straight line and that the course of history is not inevitable. It's made up of moments of possibility, of hope, of solidarity, of choices and actions at the grassroots level, just like our world today. It shows us that the issues we're up against now and the values we share and live out sit within this much larger context. It shows us that freedoms are not guaranteed, that they need to be protected and advanced by each new generation. But Reconstruction is also one of the most misunderstood and glossed over and suppressed eras of US history in K through 12 and public memory in large part because of its value to us and to our students, because learning about it encourages us to question the status quo and work together for something better and many people in power, people controlling the master narrative here don't want us to do that. And that's what we at the Zen Education Project found in uh, a report we released last year. We studied state standards and district curricula to better understand Reconstruction's place in K through 12 education. And if we could put up a snapshot of our key findings, which we can also post in the chat and we can share again later. Um, Essentially, we found that standards need to be radically improved across the country. And we have recommendations in the report for doing that, for teaching reconstruction, and a whole campaign devoted to it with lessons and resources for educators and students and anyone who wants to learn this history. And um, yeah, so these are some of our findings, which we can we can share more and, and which appear on our report website. Um, so we can take those down for now because I'm so excited now to talk with Michelle Coles about an amazing resource, her young adult novel that centers on reconstruction and its connections today. Black was the ink, got it right here. So welcome Michelle and thank you for joining us. Hi Mimi, thanks for having me. Everybody's in it, Teaching for Change, DC, every all of you guys, thanks for having me. Absolutely, okay. so. Let's just get right into it. Can you can you start by telling us a little about the plot of Black Was the Ink and your inspiration for writing it? Absolutely. So the plot, it starts off, uh, some people compare it to the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air at the very beginning, because it starts off with a young teenage African-American uh, boy from D.C., and he gets into uh, a scuffle on a basketball court that makes his mother concerned for his safety. And so she decides to send him away for the summer to stay with relatives. Um, instead of Bel-Air, those relatives are in Natchez, Mississippi, and they live on a farm that has been in their family family for generations. Um, and so the main character's name is Malcolm. He goes down very begrudgingly to Mississippi, to this farm. It's really the last place he'd like to be. He uh, wants to be hanging out with his friends over the summer, playing basketball and video games. Um, but instead, he is learning how to feed pigs and haul hay and everything else that he's not interested in doing. Um, but when he gets down to the farm, he ends up learning that the state of Mississippi is in the process of taking his family's land. And uh, this is an extension of something the state had done previously in the 1950s when the interstate highway system was first being constructed. And, and that's a very familiar uh, experience to a lot of African-American families across the country, including my own. I'm uh, from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I, uh, based that part of the plot on my own family's experience where the interstate highway system was routed directly through my grandmother's neighborhood and destroyed their sense of community. Um, 
and and I should add that the story at uh, in the present moment is is set in the year 2015. And so uh, when Malcolm finds out that the state wants to expand the highway and to do so, they'll need to take his family's farm. He doesn't particularly care. He didn't really want to be at the farm in the first place. And so he's kind of a little uh, bit like good riddance, but he ends up having an encounter with a ghostly ancestor. And that ancestor is someone who lived during the Reconstruction era and worked as legislative aide to some of the first Black members of Congress. And this ancestor is the one who originally purchased the farm and the land and um, wants Malcolm to understand how important that land is. And so the ancestor is able to send Malcolm on a magical journey to the Reconstruction era uh, to walk in his shoes so that he can really understand what's at stake and how hard Black people had fought for whatever rights we gained and the impact of, of those rights being stripped away. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I love the way that you introduce Malcolm and then introduce him to his his ancestors and, and sort of all of these other um, figures of Reconstruction. And so that makes me think a little bit about historical research, which takes a lot of forms, you know, depending on the project and the audience and accessibility and all sorts of factors. And I love that you weave primary sources all the way through Black Was the Ink and, and show some great images um, so that readers can really see them. And so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your research process, what that was like as you worked on the book. Absolutely. So I, like most of the people in the audience tonight, I didn't really know that much about Reconstruction when I started writing the book. Um, my background, I, I am I'm a civil rights attorney, which makes it, I think, even even sadder that I, I, you know, I was a civil rights attorney at the Justice Department for 12 years. I went to Howard Law School. So I went to an HBCU for law school. And, and like many HBCUs, Howard Law and Howard University were both founded in the Reconstruction era. And, and so I had all of these, I had a lot of different touch points to the Reconstruction era without really even being aware of how much my life intersected with a period 150 years ago. Um, and, and I just want to touch on my inspiration for the story because it ties in a little bit with the research um, and the inspiration. I started writing this story in the summer of 2015 when I was on maternity leave um, from work and at the Justice Department. And um, that summer is when the Mother Emanuel massacre occurred. Um, and I, I think everyone on this call is probably remembers it. But when I do school presentations now, it's all, it's always really interesting to me that most of the students I speak to have never heard of it because they were so young when it happened. And so it's interesting just how quickly these horrific moments escape our 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 memory, our consciousness. Um, but I was I was on maternity leave, and I you know saw that there was this young teenage. And, and that was really striking to me that the child was a, a teenage white supremacist, similar to Buffalo and, you know, so many other places that we see. It's often young, young people that have been indoctrinated in, um, you know, this dogma of, of white supremacy. And, you know, he went into the historic Mother Emanuel Church and sat in Bible study for an hour before, you know, unleashing this um, his weapon and killing nine people that had done nothing to him. And so, and so I was, I was watching that unfold and then side by side, I'm looking at my infant son and I'd never seen anything um, like that happen in my lifetime, that degree of just like violence and, you know, disregard for, um, for, for so many lives. It was, it, for me, it felt like something that I had read about happening in the civil rights movement with, you know, the 16th street um, church bombing or the assassinations of civil rights leaders and things like that. Like certainly there was precedent for it, but I feel like in the 40 years I'd been on earth, I couldn't recall another incident like that happening to, to black people. And so I, um, I, I felt like what I had believed and, and you, you referenced this in your opening, I had sort of believed that we were on a continuous, um, uh, we were gonna continuous, continuously, continue, continue to make progress is what I'm trying to say. 
as a country. I kind of felt like things would naturally continue to get better. Like time alone would be enough to heal some of the racial divisions that have been so baked into our country's history. But, you know, with time, we, you know, had greater democratic representation. We had elected the country's first black president. We were seeing all of these signs, I think, of of racial progress. But in that moment, it struck me that the progress was not necessarily inevitable, nor was it necessarily a straight line, and that it could in fact be cyclical. And, um, and so I looked into the history of the church, and ended up learning that one, it was founded by Denmark Vesey, um, who led one of the largest attempted slave revolts in American history. Um, and of course, it was unsuccessful, and he was executed along with all of his co conspirators. Um, the church had to go underground uh, all the way up until the end of the Civil War because Black people in, in that area in South Carolina and Charleston were prohibited from practicing their religion. And then the church reemerged in the Reconstruction era. And, and then I learned that um, the pastor who led the church in the Reconstruction era was a man named uh, Richard, quote unquote, Daddy Kane. And not only was he the leader of the church, but he was one of the first Black members of Congress. And, and so that right there was really the spark that that made this whole story come together because I was seeing in, in one location, in one place in time, a thread that connected not just slavery, but the uh, active resistance to slavery and oppression through Denmark Vesey. And then I was seeing a period of empowerment and hope that the end of, of slavery brought about and you know Black people being citizens for the first time. What did that mean, being able to engage in the political process and be members of Congress. And, um, and then I'm still looking at the present in 2015 and seeing a teenage white supremacist come into a, the same church where this other history has occurred and killing nine innocent people. Um, and so that, that was the background. The research, um, well, for one thing, you know, there aren't a lot, there are, there are a, a decent number of books about the Reconstruction era but very few, I would say, are um, accessible or easily accessible to young readers, to young people, to people without a, uh, a you know, PhD, a very, like a very high level of education. And, and so I really wanted to take what was out there and distill it and put it in a story that was relatable and understand, you know, easy to understand, because I felt like this narrative was so important. And if we just lock it away in an ivory tower and only so few people are really able to access it, then I think we're losing something as a country. Um, but one of my first resources was W.B. Du Bois' A Black Reconstruction in America. And this book was so seminal in reframing the narrative around the Reconstruction era, as Nimi alluded to. Um, there's been a lot of misinformation and distortion quite intentionally uh, baked into our school curriculum about what Reconstruction was and what it wasn't. And W.B. Du Bois was one of the first people to challenge that. Um, to challenge the narrative that Reconstruction was an abject failure. And he really made the important point that what Reconstruction actually was, was it was an important step in our country realizing the principles of our democratic republic. Um, you know, because prior to the Reconstruction era, um, you know, not only was, was slavery completely legal, but there was there were no um, guaranteed rights of citizen for people in this country, not until the 14th Amendment was passed. And so that was the, the Reconstruction Amendments altogether, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments radically transformed this country and, and made it so much closer, at least on, in, on paper, to the ideals that our founders set out at the beginning. Um, another really great resource was the Library of Congress itself. They have an online database, so you don't even have to go in, per in person, but they have all of the congressional hearings, debates, testimony going back over 100 years. And, um, and so something that was really important to me was pulling up 
the debates that I was interested in and using the Congress people's own words as best I could so people could read for themselves like what was really at issue and what was really happening. And then I'll just highlight a couple other books. I know you've got more questions than I've been talking, but um, this book, Capital Men, is a really helpful resource. It's a uh, it's a nonfiction um, that breaks down the the lives of the first black members of Congress, and there were sixteen of them, including two United States senators. And so this book pretty much devotes a chapter to each of the first black members of Congress, and they were all really incredible, fascinating people that um, people should remember their name. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Eric Foner, who uh, is considered the preeminent scholar on the Reconstruction era and has written several books on Reconstruction. And so I would say um, those were my main resources and I have others as well, but those were the ones that I used the most. All right, thank you. Yeah, and we, and, and um you know, we'll send out resources after, but all of those are, are also listed on our um, report site where there's a resources section for anyone who wants to check those out. I want to try to get in two more questions very quickly in the next um, few minutes before, before we move on back to the book. So one is a question about audience and purpose. And I think you were already getting at this, but in case you want to draw out anything else, who would you say... Black was the ink is for and and really what would you like them to take away from it? I would say that I would say Black was the ink is for all Americans and anyone interested in understanding why the racial um, divide in our country has continued for as long as it has. Um, and then I would I would break that down into different groups. I think Black Was the Ink is absolutely for Black kids because I found the stories of the first Black members of Congress and what what Black people were doing in the Reconstruction era, coming out of centuries of enslavement and the way that they were building their communities and founding, you know, historically Black colleges and universities and helping create a framework for public education in our country, which didn't exist in the South prior to the Reconstruction era. Um, and, you know, building churches and trying to reunite with lost family members and just all of the ways that, that I saw Black people embrace their humanity and their rights as citizens and taking ownership of that. I found all of that to be so inspiring as a Black person. And so I definitely think this story is for Black kids out there um, to give them a sense of hope and inspiration for what their ancestors accomplished that they most more than likely aren't even aware of. Um, but I also I also think the story is definitely for white children um, because I think it gives you a broader sense of what our country is and the possibilities of what our country can be. Um, something that uh, I think was really important that I that I included in the book was not only telling the stories of, you know, of, of Black people, but also talking about the important role that white people played in bringing um, this era of uh, increased racial equality to fruition. You know, people like Senator Charles Sumner, um, who was a, you know, was just a huge advocate for, I'd say, American principles, like all men are created equal, you know, and, and, and he was willing to put his life on the line for that. He worked his butt off to pass a um, Civil Rights Act in 1875, which was, which the 1964 Civil Rights Act um, was largely patterned off of. And all the way back in 1875, it, it passed, it became law, and it prohibited discrimination in most places open to the public. And so I think it's mind boggling to find out that so much of what was achieved in the civil rights era, uh, the modern civil rights era of the 1960s, had actually already been achieved 100 years before, but had been undermined and dismantled. Um, and so, and I, and so I think it's so important for white people, for white children to be able to see themselves in this narrative of, of how do we make our country stronger, more unified and, and living up to our founding principles. And so that they're not alienated by, you know, I think 
a lot of politicians or people right now really want to pit us against each other. And I think this is a, a, a very unifying story of working together to, to make our country, um, you know, stronger. Um, and I, and I would also say, so not just black and white, but everyone else, because, you know, for people that are the children of immigrants that come to America, this is not a story that's a part of their family's history. And so, um, and so I think it's really important as, you know, as they are, you know, become adults, voting age adults and, and everything else in this country to understand the history of how we got here a little better. Um, because the, I think the public narrative really, like you said, it skips over the most important parts. Um, and then lastly, adults, because as in the first activity, as you saw, most adults, we came through this education system that, uh, you know, gave the Reconstruction Era really short shrift. And so I've heard from so many adults who have read the book and they tell me they spend the entire time reading it on Google because they can't believe that there's so much that happened in our country's history that they'd never even heard of. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And I know we have to, um, we're going to shift to breakout rooms in a minute. To uh, I wanted to take a second. Well, one, um, uh, what, what aha moments, what reflections, uh, questions, things that arose for you that you might want to share in the chat, please do that. Um, but we also, since we have Michelle here, um, wanted to spend a few minutes to see if you all had any questions um, that maybe weren't answered during the Q&A portion um, before breakout rooms. Um, you can do that now as well. So so again, Q&A with Michelle, what curiosities, questions, things that have gone unanswered do you have for her? Um, and if there's anything else you'd like to share in the chat, um, please do that. But unmute or raise your hand um, for any questions, do, questions that you have for Michelle. Well, one person in the chat asked me, um, not in the chat, in the breakout room, asked me if the book aligned with any standards. And so I, I told them I had like a tech set and I was going to reference it. So I'm just going to add in the chat the common core standards that um, that I've been informed my my book connects to. So hopefully that's right. So I'm just going to add that into the into the chat for the people that were interested. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is your next book? So still working on my next book. It's um, a work in progress and hope to be going out on submission on it soon. But it is going to be a young adult historical fiction about the Haitian Revolution. And so I think I think that's what my calling is, is to find these um, underexplored uh uh, errors in history, I would say Black history, but it's obviously world history and American history and everyone's history, but these un underexplored periods of history that, um, you know, Black people were significant players and, and try to bring that to life for young people so that they can reimagine new possibilities for, for themselves. Any other questions? There's one in the chat from Latoya. Uh, Michelle, are you doing any book clubs with the book? Yeah, I, I've done a ton, um, a ton of speaking events in general, and I've done book clubs. I've done some book clubs for young readers. I've done some sorority book clubs and, um, you know, I've done school events, speaking at schools, um, speaking at colleges. And so I've, I've had a wonderful opportunity with engage, to engage with a lot of different audiences at, at different levels. And so um, if you, if you're interested in having me come, uh, you can email me through my website. If, if you're interested in having me speak at like a, you know, a larger venue, um, my website also has the speaker bureau that represents me and, um, you can either contact them directly or I can put you in touch with them. I'm reading, I'm reading the, the comment. Okay, so let me see. Please complete the sentence with whatever words or phrase come to mind. Fiction creates blank for deeply exploring reconstruction and hard history. Um, fiction creates opportunities for deeply exploring reconstruction and hard, and hard history. So I think uh, 
I think fiction is just, a, it's a wonderful tool to use. That was actually another question that someone raised in the breakout session that I joined was how, how, how does a book like this fit into teaching about reconstruction? And, um, and I think that a lot of times history can feel very unrelatable and, uh, you know, distant and maybe boring to young people. And, and I think what you realize, the more you um, delve into history is how people back then were really grappling and facing the same types of problems that we're facing today in the present, and that these people are not really that different from us at all. Um, and and so I think once it becomes relatable and once you can see yourself in their shoes and wonder how you would react in, in that circumstance, um, I think it becomes a lot more interesting. And I think fiction is a great tool to let you step into someone else's shoes in a different time, in a different place and see yourself there. And so, so it's not just this, you know, abstract black and white uh, you know, type, type picture that you can't relate to, but it takes, it takes on color and it takes on life. And, you know, um, I think that's, that's when history comes alive and it becomes fun and memorable. One, one thing that I mentioned in the breakout group I'm joined, that I joined that I'll, I'll mention here is that Black Coast Inc. has a really wonderful teacher's guide as well. And it has a lot of activities in the guide that uh, you could do, you could use in your classroom to bring, uh, you know, the story to life and help your kids engage even more. And one activity that I've been doing in the month of February, Black History Month, is I have been encouraging people to, um, to find places around them, wherever they are in the country, that has a, a kind of underexplored connection of Black history and, and taking a picture there. And I, you know, I call it my Black was the Ink Black History Month Challenge. And so I encourage people to, you know, they could take a picture with my book or they could take a picture with another book about Black history, but going to a site that has a connection. Um, and, and it really, I think it highlights how some of this history or a lot of this history is not as distant and far away as we may think it is because you can see living proof right outside your door of the buildings and the homes and the places where these people live and they're still right there and you know all around us and so I think it really drives home the point that this history is living it's alive the past is prologue and we need to um, to learn from it so that we can all do better. Beautiful. Thank you for that. I think that's a wonderful segue into uh, our closing. Kimberly, I'm going to share my screen. Will you talk to the folks about uh, some of the ways that they can continue um, storytelling um, in, in this tradition of, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter at school, being on a positively Black, all of that? Yeah, so first and foremost, we are so glad that you joined us and so grateful that you took time out of your evening for this conversation. Um, we would, as Vanessa mentioned before, this event was part of Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action and the ongoing Year of Purpose. And so we encourage you to share your story with our team, report back how you're participating in the Black Lives Matter at School Year of Purpose. And we will share in the chat right now, the report back form. We'd love to hear from you. What are you doing? What are your colleagues doing? What is happening at your school? And lastly, at DCASJ and at Teaching for Change more broadly, we really, really value your feedback. We want to use your insights to help us craft future learning opportunities. And so we ask that you complete the brief evaluation to receive either a printed copy of the reconstruction report or a picture book, YA book of your choice. And so if you click that link, you'll be able to access the brief evaluation. We have a few minutes, so you are welcome to stay on, to complete the evaluation, to continue to mingle and ask questions. But thank you again for your time, and we look forward to reading your feedback.